Hi everybody, and welcome back to our final discussion of Unit 4, Chapter 16, Ergogenic Aids. So when we're talking about ergogenic aids and things that are going to improve performance, what I need you to realize is there are two distinct classes of kind of performance enhancing substances. The first one is our ergogenic aids, which you're probably familiar with. Um, these are going to basically help improve an athlete's ability um, to perform work. So it gives them a higher capacity or um, more strength or more favorable conditions to perform. On the flip side of that, we have something called an ergolytic aid. And this is going to help reduce an athlete's workload or help them recover faster. So either one of these substances are going to help ultimately improve sports performance. So this also comes to a point where how do we actually classify performance enhancing substances? So performance enhancing substances, we have to classify them on if I actually have research evidence that proves that these work. So um, going to GNC, and there is, not to knock GNC, um, but going to the vitamin store of some sort and having them say, oh, this is our new wonder supplement that's supposed to do all of these things for you. If none of those claims are substantiated by research, we don't actually consider those performance enhancing substances. So the next thing to be considerate of is the two different classifications that you typically interact with with ergogenic aids. There are perfectly legal nutritional ergogenic aids. So these are things that you can take that aren't against the rules. Um, they tend to come from natural or nutritional sources, um, or they have been distilled down to kind of their component parts to help increase performance. We also have prohibited substances. So these are things that have been shown and documented to improve performance, but they are banned by some sort of governing body. So the NCAA, um, U.S. Drug Administration, um, International Olympic Testing Societies. Um, these are substances that we have discovered cause more harm than good. Therefore, they have been banned. So let's break each of these down. So looking at our nutritional aids. We have bicarbonate and sodium citrate supplements, beta alanine, caffeine, cherry juice, polyphenols, creatine, and nitrates. Um, so looking at bicarbonate as our first substance, um, basically individuals tend to take bicarbonate because it's going to help them uh, buffer their blood um, and kind of increase their blood pH to help them um, with these wide swings in blood pH that can decrease performance. Um, basically, this allows a delayed onset of anaerobic fatigue. So this is very beneficial for our anaerobic athletes. Um, typically, you need to consume somewhere around 300 milligrams per kilogram. Um, taking that large of amount of bicarbonate, though, tends to lead to GI distress. So while it may work, it does tend to cause GI issues. Um, so sodium citrate has been a proposed um, substitute for this. Um, it gives you very similar results without the risk. Um, so moving on to beta alanine, this is in a lot of pre-workout supplements. Um, it is going to increase the muscle cell camazine levels um, and increase buffering as well, just like bicarbonate. So it tends to help you with anaerobic performance. Unfortunately, you take large enough amounts of beta alanine to actually help you, it tends to make it feel like your skin has ants under it. It's very tingly, um, kind of uncomfortable. The one time I took pre-workout, I took way too much um, to start with because I listened to one of my bro friends on how much I was supposed to take, and it kind of felt like my face was melting off. It's not a very comfortable feeling. Um, so if you can tolerate that kind of face melting off, tingling under the skin feeling, um, it's going to help you with pH buffering. Uh, your next substance is caffeine. This is probably the most widely used um, substance to improve performance. It is a central nervous system stimulant. It's going to make you feel more awake. It's going to um, give you alertness, concentration. It's going to help mobilize free fatty acids. Um, and you tend to have a resp faster response to stimulus. Um, also, you don't feel as tired when you consume caffeine, so you have a lower perception of effort. Um, unfortunately, if you overdo caffeine, 
you can cause issues with like tremors, nervousness, uh, insomnia. Um, also caffeine can be highly addictive. Um, so as somebody who drinks lots and lots of coffee, I can attest to this. Um, individuals that utilize caffeine to improve their performance, if you keep consuming caffeine, you need more and more to get a similar effect, um, which does not really help with performance after a certain point because the more caffeine you consume, the more detrimental effects that you will see. Um, so I know at the tail end of my career as an NCAA athlete, they were starting to ban um, certain levels of caffeine consumption at competitions. Um, there were too many individuals that were over consuming caffeine and putting themselves at risk for cardiac arrest. Um, so your next one is your uh, cherry juice polyphenols. Um, these are shown to help with inflammation and injury recovery. Um, so tart cherry juice, um, you can get this at most grocery stores. Um, it is meant to be kind of an antioxidant um, and help with recovery. Um, and research has shown that there is a perceived reduction in pain. Um, so consuming this can be very good for injured athletes or assisting in recovery um, or just general anti-inflammatory responses. Um, next one is creatine. This is the second most highly studied substance outside of caffeine. Um, basically why somebody would take creatine is because it's supposed to help with peak power production and help you recover more efficiently for workouts. Um, research tends to lean towards the second option of it improves recovery over necessarily this full power production. Um, so creatine is only really beneficial for our anaerobic athletes. Um, this is why it is so common um, in strength sports uh, to consume it. Um, so basically it is going to assist with muscle recovery and strength gains. Unfortunately, if you overconsume creatine, or you consume creatine and do not have an adequate amount of water intake, what ends up happening is you kind of really mess up your kidneys and your liver. Um, so if you are going to consume creatine, one, your diet better be on point, and two, you need to be very careful to not overconsume and consume adequate amounts of water with it. The other thing about creatine is it's very finicky. Um, it is, there's a wide range of individual results. Some people can take creatine and it gives them massive improvements in strength and recovery. Other individuals take creatine and it does very little for them. They almost see no difference between taking creatine and not taking creatine. Um, so when I was a high school strength coach, I usually told my athletes, don't take creatine unless your rest, your diet, and your nutrition, and your water are completely on point and you're getting enough sleep. If you're doing all of that perfect, then we can talk. Um, so creatine, very highly studied, very beneficial, but make sure that you are adequately hydrated when consuming. All right, and then the final of our legal nutritional substances are nitrates. Um, so basically nitrates are going to be vasodilators. They're going to open up the capillaries and increase the delivery of oxygen naturally. Um, mostly what we see uh, nitrates consumed with is individuals consuming beet juice. Um, personally, I think beets taste like dirt. Um, so that's one of the finicky things about beets. Some people are hypersensitive to the taste and consuming nitrates are not very beneficial for them. Um, basically, when you get this big vasodilation, you're gonna have improved time till exhaustion, uh, reduced oxygen consumption, and typically reduce systolic blood pressure. So this allows you to go for longer periods of time. Um, unfortunately, uh, individuals that take medications that affect uh, nitrogen oxide metabolism are going to be at severe risk. So individuals with heart disease that take nitrates um, to help with heart conditions. All right, so flipping to the other side of things, we have our prohibited substances things that legally you cannot take and participate in sport. Uh, the first one's gonna be stimulants. Um, when we think of stimulants, the first thing that probably pops in our head is caffeine, and then not far behind are things like our amphetamines and their other related compounds. Um, obviously, because they are a stimulant, they are going to suppress appetite, boost metabolism, combat fatigue. Um, you're gonna be super alert, super on top of things. Um, you may feel indestructible 
um, and you're going to have massive improvements in performance. And that's basically because you've taken your sympathetic nervous system and cranked it up to 11. Um, so there are lots of potential benefits here. Um, also, we tend to see higher rates of arousal. Um, individuals have increased energy, increased self-confidence. They don't feel tired. Um, unfortunately, they also have increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Um, blood glucose levels really crank up. Free fatty acids really crank up. Um, so, yeah, and people tend to die on stimulants. Um, so, and that's typically due to cardiac arrhythmias. Um, they are also incredibly addictive substances. Um, and people coming off of stimulant addictions uh, go through a really horrible detox period. So it may improve your performance, but it could also kill you. Um, next are anabolic steroids. This is probably the one you are most familiar with on the banned substances list. Um, these typically tend to be our male sex hormones and their um, derivatives or precursors. Um, so testosterone being the biggest one of these, endosterone is another one. Um, basically, when you consume these anabolic steroids, it's going to give you these big increases in muscle mass, reduced fat mass, and it's going to help you recover very quickly from exhaustive exercise. So basically, you are able to really beef up your metabolic and muscular systems with very little recovery needed. Um, also, you're going to see increases in muscle size and strength, um, and you're going to get less muscle fiber damage, so you are going to be able to hop back into a more intense workout much more quickly. Um, you need very large doses of anabolic steroids to make them work. You can't do little baby small doses. Like, if you're going to do anabolic steroids, you have to consume massive doses. Um, you also need to be a chronic user of them. So you can't, uh, so typically individuals that use anabolic steroids have these very complicated cycles that they go on. Um, where they boost up on some of them, and then as they're coming down, they boost up the next one. So it's this very complex cycling thing. Um, unfortunately, um, with anabolic steroids, it tends to cause a lot of issues. Hardening of the arteries, cardiac vascular disease, sterility. Um, in men, uh, in females, they tend to start to develop male characteristics. The voice deepens. Um, facial hair becomes very obvious. Um, also, women stop having menstrual cycles, which is another fertility issue. Um, men also start to experience impotence. Um, and then there's the general concept of roid rage. Um, so really bad psychological effects of anabolic steroids as well. Um, you could also have increased risks of liver and prostate cancer consuming anabolic steroids. Um, inappropriate cardiac hypertrophy, um, especially with the right ventricle. So now we're having issues getting blood to our lungs. Um, you can also put yourself at increased risks of thrombosis, th thrombosis uh, arrhythmias, and hypertension. You also kind of really mess up your cholesterol levels. All right, so our next one is human growth hormone. Human growth hormone um, has a lot of benefits uh, with recovery, especially stimulating protein and nucleic acid synthesis. Um, it also helps stimulate bone growth, and you recover much more quickly. Um, it also is going to help give you more favorable blood glucose levels. Um, however, risks of this, um, you can have issues with enlargement of your internal organs, cardiomyopathy, hypertension, um, and you can actually put yourself at risk of diabetes. Um, next are diuretics. Diuretics tend to be used uh, for temporary weight reduction and very rapid weight loss. Um, these can also really dehydrate people, so this means that they're going to be at risk of having impaired thermoregulation and serious electrolyte imbalances. Um, our next one is beta blockers. Um, basically, individuals consume beta blockers to enhance their physical steadiness. Um, typically, we see this in shooting sports, um, and they make it easier to aim between your heartbeats. Um, so you will get a decrease in your resting submaximal and maximal heart rate. Um, beta blockers are actually prescribed for cardiac uh, patients. Um, the risks of over-consuming beta blockers, though, individuals tend to be lightheaded. Um, they will fatigue quicker. Um, and you can also have bronchiospasms that occur in people, which lead to asthma attacks. And you can also lead to blood or low blood sugar. 
Um, next is blood doping. Um, so you can blood dope in two different ways. Um, you can consume something called EPO or erythropoietin. Um, this is a hormone that works on the kidneys and the adrenals, and it causes your body to produce more red blood cells. Um, when this occurs, more red blood cells allow you to carry more oxygen um, throughout the blood body, and this is going to improve aerobic performance. Um, erythropoietin or EPO is very highly tested for um, nowadays, so they've had to go back to old school blood doping. Um, so this is going to be removing um, a certain amount of blood from your body, storing it, and then re-injecting it into your bloodstream at a different time. Um, the plus side of this big aerobic performance is you're going to see big bouts uh, with oxygen carrying capacity and improved endurance. The downside of this is all of these extra red blood cells make your blood very, very thick and put you at risk of cardiac arrest. Um, it's kind of like your body trying to plump or pump maple syrup through your body. It does not work. Um, also, this constant stabbing of needles and putting blood back and taking it out puts you at risk of uh, bloodborne pathogens and other diseases. And then finally, our last uh, thing I want you to talk about is be very wary of your substance or of your supplements that you consume. Um, in the United States, supplements are not regulated. This means that anybody can say, this is my new health supplement, and the FDA, which regulates our food, and the USDA, which regulates our drugs, neither of them have any say in supplements because it is neither classified as a food or a drug. If you choose to consume supplements, be very wary of where you get them from. Um, the USP seal uh, is a third party um, that actually goes out and tests supplements to see if they have what they actually say they have in them. Um, I would highly recommend any multivitamins you consume or other substances that you try to find something that has a USP seal on it. Um, otherwise, you don't necessarily always know what you're paying for. Um, there have been many athletes that have purchased supplements and have been consuming them and did not realize there were illegal substances in them and then they pop positive on a drug test and now they've lost their eligibility. Um, so be very cautious on what supplements you take, where you get them from, and if they say what they really say they are. So that is chapter 16. Um, this will be the last chapter of this unit. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, guys. Bye.